you for joining us for part two in this series on preschool inclusion. This series is brought to you by Starnet Regions 1 and 3 and Early Choices. If you have not already viewed part one in this series, we recommend you do so before viewing part two. In part two, we dive deeper into inclusion and what successful implementation looks like at the program and classroom level. Again, we will be hearing from our experts at the state level with Early Choices, Emily Ropars and Ann Kramer, as well as hear reflections from staff in the Urbana and St. Charles School Districts, both recipients of the Award of Excellence for Inclusion of Children with Special Needs. Early Choices uses the What Makes Inclusion Work in Early Childhood wheel, and um, that was developed with Early Choices and the Early Childhood LRE Stakeholders Consortium. And we've, it's kind of two, twofold. It has a graphic that kind of supports all the components. And then to look further, we kind of bulleted out the key items for each of those. So for each bubble, like vision and attitude, there are bullets underneath. And it's kind of all premised on the fact that that center says what makes early childhood inclusion work, but it's really what makes education work. And so when you look at all of these practices, they're all developmentally appropriate and based off of the DEC recommended practices. So it kind of um, just enhances those pieces to look at what, what we need in place to support inclusion. When we talk about our classrooms, we communicate our inclusive philosophy by telling families that um, we have ch children in our classrooms with and without IEPs. Uh, we always have one teacher and one teaching assistant, and we'll put more supports in if children in that classroom need it. But our school's blended. We have three, four, and five-year-olds in every classroom. We have It's, it's just stated right out there. We always give families a tour, talk about what services we provide, and what's in our building and what's in our classrooms and why we do what we do. So I think that sets a, a right up front tone with the families. This is what we do and how we do it. It's just factual and it is how it is. We do similar things with our staff. When we hire new staff, we make sure that they have both uh, a type four early childhood certificate as well as a special ed uh, certification and licensing so that they know that they will serve as both the general education teacher and the special education teacher and that they need to have the skills to meet the all students needs or will help help them do that it's it is what it, we do it is how we do it so um, it's just the culture so as we learned from the research vision and attitude is a key could be a key barrier to inclusion but it's also a really strong foundation for inclusion so we like to start with programs looking at their vision and attitudes um, within their own program towards inclusion. And so it's really important for programs to look at their vision statement, look at their mission statement for their program. Does it mention inclusion in there? And if it doesn't start talking as a team, well, we need to think about that. If it's our value, we need to put it out there right out front with families so we can communicate to families with children who have disabilities and those without disabilities and the community at large to be really clear that we're an inclusive program. And that needs to be a team process. Um, it works best when the whole team can come together and take time to talk about their true beliefs about their program and their strengths um, and then be able to unify that into a shared vision. I think um, one of the big things to think about that's a potential barrier is lack of understanding in, um, in programming, for example, is one piece, or lack of understanding um, for that purpose. And I think that there comes to need some work toward really looking at human behavior, behavior as well um, within a school setting and really fostering an environment where there's a strong climate and culture. And I think that if you have a strong climate and culture, then you have a program that can be more impactful for all the students. As a director of the program, I am charged with the opportunity to go out into the community and share about our community preschool and our blended program. And the one um, opportunity that I get to do is we are part of a preschool forum in the community at the Park District. So I really share a lot of information about how we are an inclusive um, classroom and that you're going to have students of all different um, diverse needs 
And um, then we also bring um, the opportunity to share our inclusive practices when we have um, a tour of our buildings to share with families. Um, so we share that. Um, our website has a lot of information about how um, students in our school district preschool program are a combination of three, four, and five-year-olds and students with varying um, ability levels. Um, and then we invite parents in all the time to um, volunteer and get an opportunity to work alongside some of those students. Professional learning is another key, key component to making inclusion work in early childhood. And, um, and that piece is making sure that we have uh, professional learning opportunities for our staff and that includes all of our staff. So not just our teachers, but our related service and our paraeducators. And, um, and then making sure that folks have some follow-up coaching with that professional development so that they can implement those practices in their classrooms. One of the ways to build upon that professional learning and the vision and attitudes is to have formal time to plan and reflect. Teams need to be able to get together and talk about how things are going in their classroom, look at their data, make plans, and be intentional about their teaching strategies. And again, when we talk about team, we mean everybody who's supporting the children in that classroom, the paraeducators, the specialized service supports, um, and when necessary, the family too. It's really important for all team members who are supporting a child to have that time, and it needs to be protected time that won't be taken away um, based on other needs in the program that is held for programs to um, support each other. So our collaboration time typically happens during prep time. Our teachers, by contract, get a prep time every day. And we believe that that collaboration is so key to the child's success because that's when the speech therapist, occupational therapist, the social worker, sometimes the parents, sometimes myself, the teaching assistants and the teachers all get together to talk about what's coming up, what's been happening, how the children are doing, and to problem solve and plan. And so that makes for a successful and a supportive team. And of course, we can't do that without administrative support. So we really need um, our administrators to support building those structures for that time and that professional learning. But then also um, administrators need to take responsibility in terms of making sure we're fulfilling those requirements between IDEA and other state guidelines. So um, really administrators need to take, be able to support their team but then also take the lead in um, moving the, the program forward. I feel like having a principal such as Chris in our school that's able to give us the support we need to better serve the students and the families. She also listens to us and the teachers and the TAs in the building as well. I feel like we have a very unique administrator at that point of view. She really gives us the opportunity to discuss things and takes our concerns and our values and what we want to do into consideration upon making decisions. And if there's a training opportunity or a extracurricular event that happens that would help us professionally, she is always willing and able, if it fits in our budget, to send us so we can gain more knowledge about the specific types of students and their needs that we have in our classroom. And of course, none of this can be successful without true strong partnerships with families and community members. Um, families have such an important part um, at that table discussing what their goals are for their child. They're the child's first teacher. They're the expert on their child and that needs to be honored and mirrored in all the practices and policies of the program. Um, you can't get a whole picture of a child without the family at the table. And oftentimes children are in multiple environments. They might be in daycare before they come to school. They might be in an early childhood program um, through the park district at another time. And so having everyone who supports that child have an opportunity to communicate and build relationships really supports inclusion. I think families play a very important part in making inclusion a successful experience and parents know their children the best. They know how they learn, they know all their quirks and so I think it's very important to include them in the planning of the goals. They're part of our collaborations um, throughout the year to talk about um, progress and then what comes next. I think it can't work like it should without the families. When working in an inclusive environment, communication among all parties is so crucial. 
So something that I did that I think teachers found helpful was at every new year, I would write kind of a newsletter. Um, Jonah's behavior, um, both positive and negative, his growth as well as his challenges changed constantly. So I would write a little newsletter saying, you know, this is what Jonah is up to right now. These are the um, tr transitions are tough. So these are the phrases that really work. These are the things that um, really can make a trans transition go more smoothly. These are trigger words that you don't necessarily want to use with him right now. These are some of his interests and fit current fixations, whether it be Winnie the Pooh or a particular band or something that he was particularly interested in that I knew was a powerful motivator at that time. Um, continuing to keep in touch and communicate and then the other direction as well. So new interest, new motivators, new challenges that were coming up in the classroom that his um, teachers were able to tell us, you might wanna watch for this or this is what we're seeing. Um, that was just invaluable. And then another component is the adaptations and support systems and making sure that um, we're looking at what adaptations, modifications need to happen to the curriculum, to the environment, to support the learners and then making sure that we have the support in place to, to deliver that and then support the professionals in implementing. Within my classroom I have uh, a variety of needs. So I have some students that are nonverbal. So with those students I have switches in my classroom where if you press the button um, it'll say a phrase or like today we did a question of the day and the switch said the question of the day. Uh, the kids can use nonverbal language. I have pointers in my classroom if they want to, or they can use their hands. Uh, we use a core vocabulary system, and I have core vocabulary boards all over my room. I model core vocabulary while I read, um, and then the kids are learning how to use those words uh, within their daily routine. So, um, especially with asking for help or asking for a turn or if they want something or if something's silly, they're able to show me that with that core vocabulary board. Um, and they're getting to the point now where they can do that without needing a model. They're just finding the, the pictures in the classroom and using those. With some of my students, uh, we need some sensory adaptations or some seating adaptations. So we make sure those things are available to students and that they know where they are so that they can get them on their own. Some things that I think are really helpful for students who need extra supports to be fully included in the classroom, um, like using other peers who, I'll often look for another student who um, is usually somebody who is following the expectations, a kid that doesn't need a lot of reminders or redirections in the room, um, and one who's compassionate. And I, I like to try to buddy them up. So like I have a student right now who, he doesn't actually have an IEP, but um, just for an example, he can't walk in the line. It's just not happening. But he always holds one same person's hand in line, and she's happy to do that. And so I'm, to me, that's just a perfect, simple kind of accommodation. We have a student that um, was really fearful to stand at school, and um, the other students really encourage her, and they're motivating for her. So she very quickly, her mother said she doesn't stand at home. She's very fearful, but at school within days, she was standing um, for a half hour at a time um, be at the water table with her friends and they were encouraging her. And she was fearful to go on slides and within days, because her friends would ask her, go on the slide with me. She was able to start sitting up and using her core strength to sit up and go down the slide. So very quickly, she started learning new skills that in many years in early intervention, she didn't learn because she didn't have peers around her to kind of motivate her. We know from research that high quality early childhood inclusion equals high quality early childhood education. And so we want to be using evidence-based practices in the classroom. So we want to be using a standardized curriculum that's approved by um, the Illinois State Board of Education. You want to be using tools for assessments that you would be using with typically developing children to monitor their learning. And then you want to be using those strategies like embedding your goals into activities and routines of the day and really being intentional about using what you would use for a typically developing child um, to support a high quality education. Well, and I think also under evidence-based practices, we think about the inclusive classroom profile 
and that um, gives us all that those 12 practices that support inclusive high quality inclusion and they fit nicely in line with all of our other evidence-based practices. It's really a great opportunity to be able to go into the classroom and embed those speech and language IEP goals because it gives us an opportunity to work with the child in their natural environment. So obviously language is not in a bubble. So to be able to go into the classroom and to help the child learn about different parts of language, prepositions, verbs, nouns, grammar, while they're playing is really, really powerful and important. Another advantage is being able to work with the staff and the assistants and um, giving them the opportunity to see how we cue students and how we support students so then they can carry that over to when I'm not directly in the classroom. Inclusion is really important because Students that have disabilities get to have the opportunity to be with their peers and they benefit from the models that their peers provide. So a lot of times I'm looking at the language and communication part of that and typically developing peers have tons of language, they use great long sentences, they're great models for what is expected for their language and communication skills. So those students get to see that throughout the day all the time and they provide that model in a natural environment for them. One of the specific benefits that I saw when we brought in um, more push-in services, so therapists, speech language pathologists that came in and worked with staff, worked with the teachers in the daycare setting, setting um, allowed me to watch what, what they were doing. Um, that benefit of that um, inclusive model of Jonah being there with all of the other typically developing peers is that I think I can th look at it as all of the adults in that setting learned a great deal that they would apply not just to my child but any child, even children without disabilities that might need additional, you know, an additional push in terms of language development or an additional push in terms of social skills. I think all of us were learning strategies that we could apply not just to Jonah, but to all of the children. So I think that was one big benefit. The way we look at it is where are the gaps between the child with an IEP and a child without an IEP? And is that gap significant enough that a goal needs to be written? In which case, we then look at where in the child's day uh, can those goals be fit in. If the idea is to communicate well using pictures or uh, an augmentative device, let's look at when that naturally happens in their play. It happens at center time, it happens in the morning greeting children, when they say goodbye, and let's embed those goals into that natural part of a preschool day. If it's best to do it in the gym, let's look at how he can get some therapy time in the gym, climbing on the same things his friends are climbing on. The children here learn through play. That's very easy to do at the preschool level, and it's very easy to do with three, four, and five-year-olds. All children, regardless of disabilities or skill sets, or, can play. And so it's really a matter of facilitating that with their friends and looking at how teachers can differentiate and get those supports and services in the classroom with them. And then finally we have um, collaboration and teaming which is kind of the foundation of all of this. We can't implement any of this unless we're working together to do it. And so um, as we've said we need the families, we need the staff, administration, um, everybody coming together to do all of these pieces. Look at that vision, work on our professional learning, implement our strategies and so forth. And that's where the, the teaming piece really comes together in collaboration because we need to have the administrative support to provide the time and the space for the team members in the classrooms to be able to work together to do this self-assessment and have open, frank conversations with administration about what's working and what some of the challenges are. But we also have to have an atmosphere in which team members can communicate with each other we had um, Dr. Erin Barton come to speak in Illinois, and one of the things she said that I, I always hold on to is she said about herself that she went to school to learn how to work with children, but it turns out that high quality education and inclusion really is about working with other adults. 
And so when we think about it that way, we need to have these structures in place for adults to have conversations about how they're going to collaborate to support children and make them successful. We are very lucky to work in a very collaborative and problem-solving environment in the sense that we meet regularly. We meet weekly um, for collaboration and planning. So we, as a service provider, me as a service provider, can get an idea about what the focus is um, for the curriculum in the classroom for the week, and then I can kind of tailor my activities to go along with that to support um, what the teacher is doing. I guess I would encourage and provide those educators with the idea that getting through those rough times, problem solving with parents, with um, all of the teachers serving that child, and coming up with solutions. The solutions are always there, um, but sometimes it takes a lot of work and a lot of patience on everyone's part, and maybe some accommodations in the meantime while we're figuring something out to get something in place that works. And I guess I would say as a parent that I will be forever grateful that we had those flexible educators willing to problem solve and do the hard work to be able to um, result in huge gains for my own son, but I think also um, changed horizons for all of the children that were in that classroom. Without a doubt, the most successful part of inclusion is the team, the team approach that we have in our building. Um, I could, we could not make it without the team of people that we work with. Um, and uh, that goes from um, the parents, our classroom TAs, our individual staff within the classroom, uh, speech and language therapists, occupational therapists, vision and social workers, everybody that we work with. Uh, it's just, we're all there for each other and it's a trust um, that we have each other. You know, um, we can call on anybody at any time and somebody's always willing to help. Our principal is very, she values um, collaboration very highly and she makes sure that um, our TAs are included in our collaboration, which is really important just because the TA is a huge piece of the classroom. I mean, it's not just me that the kids are dealing with. They deal with my TA just as much as they deal with me and I deal with them. So it's really neat how our TAs are able to be part of that conversation. So they're always in the know of things that are relevant to our students and know how to best work with them too. The staff and team here at the school um, really made me feel like part of the team as far as planning and structure for my daughter um, from the very beginning, um, from the day that we came to interview and test with them. Um, they asked me a lot of questions as far as what I wanted to get out of her being here and how I thought that they could help her when she was here. Um, throughout the time that she's been here, she started in August and um, the team is very quick to let me know if they're noticing any things, um, things that maybe we need to change or adjust, services that she may need and how we can get them, um, but they're also very good at listening to me and my concerns and what I feel like she needs. So I think problem solving, patience, perseverance, and just um, patience um, would all be incredibly important both for families to remember as well as educators and to know it's worth it. Early Choices has uh, been using the Inclusive Classroom Profile as a self-reflection tool and that has really been a, a great tool to support programs in looking at their practices and individual teachers making goals around what they would um, like to work on and recognizing those great practices that they already have in place. When you look at the inclusive classroom profile, one of the things that becomes evident is all about adult choices and adult behaviors. And so in, it has you reflect on the fact that we, it's not that children need to be ready to be included, Adults have a lot of different things and strategies they could be doing to support children. And so the onus of success for inclusion is the adults working together to support those children rather than the children being able to do a certain task or a certain 
be at a certain developmental level to be ready to be included. We have utilized the um, inclusive classroom profile in order to have our teachers and assistants and support staff really dig deep and look around their environment and look at their practice. So using that profile, we were able to have the staff members um, really take turns and go into each other's classrooms and document different things that they observed with regards to the students interacting with adults, um, the environment, was it accessible to students, and where they could look to make improvements, adding adapted materials, or um, for one of those uh, students who might have a speech and language um, delay, sometimes they end up kind of disappearing into the group, and the um, teaching staff finally realized after looking at that profile that, wow, it, just because they're not acting out or needing adaptive equipment, we really need to support that student by giving them um, you know, communication supports during playtime. And so it really um, opened our eyes to some of our practices that we, um, not that we were forgetting about, but that we really could look closely at and support better. I started with the big picture with the environment. Are my pathways in the classroom accessible to everybody? Can everybody reach everything in our room? So we, I moved furniture around and I ordered new furniture that was a little bit smaller. Um, I wanted to make sure that I had enough visual supports in the classroom for kids that had difficulty with language. So I worked with our speech therapist and we made sure we had just different, I don't want to keep calling it a visual support, but like we have little boards that we made for like the doctor kit or the dolls that have different things you might say when you're playing with those toys or when you're at the Play-Doh. And we keep those things throughout the classroom so that they're accessible to kids to use. And we can use and model those with the kids too so that we can comment when they're working. I have some OT adaptations in my classroom and sensory adaptations in the classroom. So really, I wanted to look at what's gonna help the students stay in this environment for the longest period of time so that they don't need to leave the environment to get services or feel like they can't participate in everything. With the ICP tool, it was very helpful to take a closer look at our program and what we do individually. It really helped us break down each element of that profile and take a closer look of how we do that. Do we do it in its full entirety, or do we need to take a step back and reevaluate how we're doing our current practices to fully have that benchmark met? When we went through the inclusive classroom profile, it was very beneficial, actually. As I've mentioned, we've been doing inclusion for a long time here in our school, but it was really a nice reminder to let's step back and see how it looks from an outsider, and let's look how it looks in each, build, each classroom as well as a whole building. And there were things that it was like, oh yes, we need to remember to do this more often, or oh yes, we need to consider that again, and we haven't thought about this for a while. So it really did beef up our processes and get us to self-reflect as to where we could do better. For me, it helped me to think about writing my lesson plans in a different way. Um, so I did add an entire page to my lesson plans thinking about how I can individualize student goals across the day. So looking at transitions, arrival, departure, just all the parts of the day, so making them the most productive for my students. But then also during large group, um, it wasn't enough that, okay, I got a student to participate in large group by sitting in a cube chair and he stayed the whole time, but he didn't answer any questions or he didn't interact with the story. So planning for different ways for me to get the students to be interactive at large group and actually taking a turn and participating. So I put that in my lesson plans too. One of the uh, recommended um, strategies that we do with Early Choices is to take that What Makes Inclusion Work uh, wheel and um, we've turned it into a planning form. So asking folks to look at each component, vision and attitude, and then looking at those bullets and thinking about what they have in place and what maybe they could uh, either put in place or beef up a little bit and, and then looking at you know those action steps to implement that. And it's been a, a helpful tool for programs to walk through each component and, and look at that and self-assess each piece 
and then make a plan about um, implementation. Um, inclusion happens naturally in our families, in our home life, and it, it doesn't stop until we do it at school. And so really thinking about when when those kinds of things happen, what are looking at our, our processes and thinking about, are we stopping inclusion or are we supporting inclusion? As you can see, successful implementation of inclusion requires a strong commitment to doing what is right for all children and having a variety of supports at the program level. Illinois is committed to supporting each and every child and we hope you will join us in this effort. In closing, I would like to leave you with this powerful quote from Erin Barton and Barbara Smith. Children with disabilities do not need to be ready to be included. Programs need to be ready to support all children.